The Philippines is only one of many parts of the world which are permanently threatened by earthquakes, and several of them have suffered damage recently. In July, Communist China was hit by a massive quake which centered on the Tang Shan district and spread as far as Peking. The Chinese have so far said very little about the disaster, and this official film is still the only version that's been allowed outside China. But the quake measured 8.2 on the Richter scale, and since Tang Shan is a mining center of at least a million people, foreign experts believe this could have been one of the worst disasters of the decade. The Chinese have admitted that at least 100,000 died, but it may well have been more. The true picture was certainly more somber than this cheerful distribution of supplies. Since Tang Shan, there's been another major quake in Sichuan province, but the Chinese insist damage was small due to early warning and preparation. If that's so, it's one of the first signs that man is at last learning to live with earthquakes. Throughout history, they've given little warning and created enormous havoc. This was Tokyo in September 1923. 74,000 people perished and 700,000 houses were destroyed. This was a powerful quake in a highly populated area. And this was an even more powerful one, which fortunately occurred in one of the world's emptier spaces, Alaska. This 1964 quake was felt over half a million square miles. In some parts, land sank by eight feet. In others, it rose by as much as 50. Damage to property totaled over $500 million, but only 114 people died. Alaska forms part of a chain of seismic activity which runs right down the west coast of both American continents. Further down the chain is San Francisco, now a solid city of tall skyscrapers, but one which is no stranger to earthquakes. It happened in 1906. Early in the morning of April 18th, California shifted on its rocky foundations over a distance of almost 300 miles. The trouble came from a geological formation known as the San Andreas Fault. San Francisco was right on top of it and suffered accordingly. Many of the city's buildings were made of wood, which meant fewer deaths from falling masonry. But the earthquake started a fire which added considerably to the damage. Even so, by earthquake standards, the death toll of around 700 was relatively low. Today, San Francisco builds as tall as any other major American city, but does it perhaps with just a little more care. Unfortunately, it's only the more modern buildings that have any inbuilt earthquake resistance. In any future quake, brick buildings like this would be lethal. So too are buildings with overhanging ledges and other decorative stoneware. Making them all safe would cost a fortune, so most of the buildings are still standing. Only a relative handful of the older structures have actually been marked out for demolition. An earthquake happens when two separate sections of the Earth's crust are subjected to different amounts of pressure. The pressure is sometimes horizontal, sometimes vertical as here, but the result is the same, a severe dislocation of the surface. These dislocations, or faults, are usually easily identifiable, especially from the air. This is the San Andreas Fault which caused the San Francisco disaster. The pressure's still there, and the land on one side is creeping slowly northwards, whilst on the other it's moving southwards. 
According to all the experts, the question is not if another major quake will hit California, but when. The town of Hollister, 90 miles south of San Francisco, lies right astride the fault. It's known as the earthquake capital of the nation, and it's had so many tremors over the years, it has considerable difficulty in staying the shape it's supposed to be. This kind of distortion can happen within a decade. In fact, the rate at which the fault moves is of vital importance to understanding what an earthquake will do next, and scientists keep a very careful eye on Hollister's splitting seams. There's so much earthquake activity here that the whole area has become a natural earthquake laboratory. The underlying rocks are constantly monitored for the tiniest possible movement, as well as for changes in temperature or magnetic properties. Most of the instruments are linked directly to a central laboratory, but some data are taped on the spot and brought in for analysis. Part of the problem is that California hasn't had enough earthquakes in the past. The geological record is sketchy, so the scientists have to construct their own. One way they do it is by listening in, like doctors, to the heartbeats of their vast and troublesome patient. The aim of these scientists, like their colleagues the world over, is to predict earthquakes. And with that in mind, the search has gone on for new and ever more accurate methods of measuring just what's happening. This is a tilt meter, which records the amount of rise or fall of surface rock. Some of the most promising work to date has come from a Russian discovery in the late 1960s. A whole series of measurements revealed that just before an earthquake, the natural wave motions through the earth dropped significantly and then rose again. American research has since confirmed this in entirely different conditions. Meanwhile, America's space agency, NASA, has been developing its own techniques. Two ground stations 500 miles apart on opposite sides of the San Andreas Fault are linked by a laser beam transmitted by satellite. Since the position of the satellite can be established with very great accuracy, even the tiniest changes in the relative position of the stations can be measured. Comparing the readings over a period of time, they should be able to determine how much the ground is moving and how fast. Another NASA another measurement project, technique is NASA bouncing radio waves off radio quasars, from which quasar are a kind of pulsating star. Our galaxy so far, though, only minor quakes can be predicted with any degree of Scientists accuracy. The big ones still come unannounced, as they did in September last year in eastern Turkey. At the center of the earthquake, the town of Lije was almost completely destroyed. In the whole of the affected area, 35,000 people lost their homes, at least 3,300 were injured, and some 2,500 were killed. In 50 earthquakes this century, Turkey suffered over 50,000 deaths. Part of the problem comes from houses like this, made with lots of stone and very little cement. Since they have no elastic strength, they simply crumble in a quake, crushing their occupants to death. 2,000 died here in Vato in 1966, yet the houses have been rebuilt in exactly the same style. In some of the most earthquake-prone areas, the government's been trying to persuade villagers to abandon their traditional dwellings for houses like these, which contain no heavy masonry and would thus cause comparatively little damage if they collapsed. Unfortunately, what seems like a good idea in a government office in Ankara doesn't always work out in practice. These walls, for example, are made of wattle and daub, and the villagers are understandably unimpressed by their ability to withstand the rigors of an Anatolian winter.
For as long as earthquakes remain unpredictable, the question of building techniques remains vital. This, for example, was Guatemala City earlier this year after an earthquake lasting just 31 seconds. The quake was severe, but by no means outstanding in intensity. And in some areas of the city, such as here in the wealthy suburb of La Cañada, the well-built houses were able to withstand the tremors. Unlike many older buildings in the city center, these homes are low rise and built mainly of concrete, which has the necessary kind of elastic strength. Carefully planned foundations also help. For most areas, though, it was a very different story. There were scenes like this all over the country. 22,000 people lost their lives and a further 74,000 were injured, most of them when buildings collapsed on top of them. At least a million people were made homeless in what was the area's most destructive quake in recent history. Relief agencies did a lot to help, and they made sure that reconstruction was done in lightweight materials such as timber and corrugated metal. This was one scheme that went a stage further, on-the-spot construction of special lightweight concrete beams. The project was sponsored by the CARE Agency, and the essential feature is the use of pumice, a volcanic rock, which is added in powder form to the cement mix. The amount of water added is very carefully measured, since too much or too little could seriously affect the strength of the resulting mix. The final amounts of liquid are added with the kind of accuracy that's not usually found on a building site, but the project's backers say the method is easily learned and can be successfully applied even in low technology areas. The mixture is put into molds to set for two days. After that, the beams need 20 days to cure before they're ready for use. They've got the same strength as a normal beam, but they're 40% lighter. And that, coupled with proper construction techniques, could mean the difference between life and death when the next quake comes. It's difficult to talk about earthquakes without also mentioning the volcanoes, which so often go with them, as red-hot lava forces its way out through the same cracks in the Earth's surface. This is Mount Etna, Europe's largest, erupting in 1971. Italy is in that part of Europe which has suffered a lot from both earthquakes and volcanoes. But in recent years, its volcanoes have generally been far less destructive, damaging property rather than people. With the lava flow bearing down on them at 50 yards an hour, the villagers saved what they could and left. For the farmers, there was a tragic irony as their trees were devoured by the very forces which had first provided them with such fertile volcanic soil. This owner of a grove of hazelnuts saw history repeating itself. His father had suffered the same fate before him, and the family fortunes had only just recovered when this disaster struck. <laughs> In times like this, people turn instinctively to the one power they believe is greater than the forces unleashed upon them. from the Mediterranean to the North Atlantic. On one evening in January in 1973, the Icelandic island of Heimei was almost split in two 
when the Helgafell volcano broke its 5,000-year sleep and erupted in a blaze of violent activity. As day came, the volcano was still spewing forth lava and huge clouds of volcanic ash. And it kept on doing so, not just for weeks, but for months. Although there'd been very little warning, casualties were very slight with no loss of life. But the damage to property was enormous. Virtually the whole of the island was covered in a thick black layer of ash. It was, as the Icelandic Premier declared, the biggest disaster in the nation's 1100-year history. For the islanders, the eruption meant almost total economic disruption and a clean-up job of nightmarish proportions. For the outside world, it provided some fascinating pictures of a volcano in action. But for images of sheer volcanic violence, there's still nothing to rival this film of Vesuvius erupting in 1944 and taken by a cameraman who clearly risked his life for every shot. Spectacular as it was, the 1944 eruption added fewer than 30 deaths to the estimated one million victims which the volcano is said to have claimed down the centuries. Since then, Vesuvius has brooded quietly over the Neapolitan plain, allowing tourists into its smoking crater, whilst guides zealously preserve its reputation as the terror and pride of the area. That reputation was first established in the year AD 79, when a powerful eruption struck Pompeii and two nearby towns. Showering rocks caved in roofs, but Pompeii was not destroyed by the lava flow, which stopped some way short of the town. Almost all of the 2,000 dead were victims of a cloud of fine volcanic ash, which killed as surely as an avalanche, but preserved the bodies intact. They were rediscovered some 16 centuries later and are still there today as constant reminders that man has no more destructive enemy than the earth on which he lives. <laughs>